I'm back. Oh. Holy smokes. Oh. Uh, you know, I, this is terrible. I'm still so shaken by this whole thing that I... I, uh... <sighs> I hope... Uh... Uh, we've already got a few advance reports. Please do not call them into the station here because uh, for some reason or other, our entire switchboard system has been, uh, it's been just not completely out of kilter. So could, uh, perhaps this, uh, you know, could have some kind of electronic ramifications that we don't even know yet about. There's all kinds of scientists and that crawling around here. And uh, we would like to hear, uh, you know, what's, what's, uh, what actually occurred in your area. Uh, we have one report, which I do not credit, uh, that a young man was listening to the just before the news when we did the scientific experiment with the Dyak curse. Uh, a young man was listening in, uh, I believe, the town was uh, West Orange. Is there such a town as West Orange, New Jersey? Well, he was listening in West Orange. His father uh, demanded that he turn this jazz off, which is the way it was put, the old man apparently used his own nomenclature to describe the show. He says, turn that jazz off. And uh, the kid got into an argument with the old man. And before they could get to the radio, both of them, both of them, fled the house screaming, trailing smoke. Uh, we don't know uh, what the further ramifications have been. Uh, we just like to know. You know, speaking, uh, we, we've got to clear the air. It's just, just, it's just too much. You know, you get too close to the primal guts. Of life, and uh, you gotta clear there. Would you please help me clear the air there, Mario? Please, please, bring he it up. Was born oh, great oh my game! Let's go, crowd! Lucky star! The lucky star! Oh, guides him! Guides him! Oh, lucky Lindy! Oh, 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 lucky Lindy! Oh, that thing's a fly! Way up there, flapping in the wind! Keep your old nose down, keep your feet up. Oh, lucky, lucky Lindy. Keep an eye on the tag. Watch out, man. Look out for that old red line. Oh, lucky, 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 lucky. That's the bubble. Lucky Lindy is popping them old wings. Oh, let's go, gang. Now here's our little So nice. That saves the day, I'll tell you. I, I, I just like to clear the air, you know. Well, you know, I want to say one thing, though. A lot of you, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of skeptics out there. And uh, I suppose if, if you've never had any experience with the supernatural, you, you know, you tend to be skeptical about it. I'm sure, you know, there's no question about that. But uh, I, I think it goes back to the experiences that you have as, an, uh, you know, as a kid with this kind of thing. You used to... The only reason I ever talk about being a kid is not because, you know, it's not, not nostalgia. You wouldn't have great, no, wouldn't have great being a kid and all that jazz. Because any legitimate walking around certified kid, you just stop any walking around certified guaranteed kid. And you ask them what it's like being a kid. And you'll get the straight dope. I mean, he's liable to kick you in a kneecap. So don't come around with his jazz, you know, his, how, how great it was. Nah, come on, it's, just, it's not great being a kid. It's, this is just a fact. It is not. It is not great not being a kid. In fact, let's put it this way, it's not great being anything, really. <laughs> you really boil it right down to the... And so, uh, I, you know, no, this is, the only reason I ever talk about this being a kid, because, you know, this is at the time, this is the moment in your life when you're beginning to absorb all these various experiences and you begin to know what the, what the world is about. Now, now, some people, luckily, have been shielded in polyethylene from the time they were born, so they can grow up to be big, fat, old, 75-year-old guys with beards and still not know which end is up. Oh, well, literally and figuratively and actually not which end is up. You know, you see them walking down the street once in a while on their hands. They don't know, you know. 
They never learned it. It was the feet that you're supposed to walk on. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, a little bit nervous about this thing we just went through. Now, I'll, I'll give you a little... Uh, again, I must say, this show is not, uh, is not, for the, not for the squeamish. This program tonight is not for the faint-hearted. It's not for those of you who, you know, who... Uh, oh, yes, we constantly get others uh, continually saying, Well, Mr. Shepard, I can't understand why there are so many nice people on your station and you have to say such, well, such bad things all the time. Well, I don't know. I, 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 I just don't know why that is, madam. I, I, I'm going to try hard, but it never works out. But nevertheless, I'm a kid, you know, and I, the, a little news item came in the other night. A little thing here from Southbridge, Massachusetts. That, has, that, that I'm not even going to read it to you because it's level of scare a few of you, too. Uh, it's cold out, right? It's cold out. Right here. Okay. Now, by cold, I mean any time it gets below freezing. It's cold enough for what I'm... for the curse I'm going to talk about. It's cold out, huh? Well, me and Schwartz and Flick and Pruner... They're walking around, scratching. In every crowd, you take four people, you're going to find three believers and one skeptic. Now, it is believed in our day and age, of course, we've got the, some interesting uh, philosophical hookers going with us these days, that uh, anybody who does not believe in a crowd is automatically right. Just like we like to believe today that anybody who is the center, because he isn't the center, is right. Well, this is a questionable thesis. There's been some great dissenters of the past that could disprove this thesis to hell and gone, if you'll excuse the expression. Among them, you know that Hitler was a great dissenter from the, from the morality code of his time. You know, oh, wow. But uh, nevertheless, that's neither here nor there. I'm a kid, you know, me and Schwartz and Flick and Proner. And, uh... Bruner was a true believer. I mean, there's always one kid in every crowd or one man in every crowd says, yeah, 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 that's right. Yes, sir, JB. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please tell me the joke again, boss. <laughs> yeah, it's funny every time you tell it. <laughs> it's 34 times. No, it's very good. Well, uh, that's the Bruner type. And then, of course, there was the uh, Schwartz type, who was not really a believer, but used to just be very silently waiting to see which way the wind was going to blow. And if the wind blew west, he went west. If the wind blew east, he went east. But that didn't mean that he believed in east or west. He always waited to see which way the crowd was going. And then there was me. I was the patsy of the crowd. There's always one guy in every crowd, believe me, friends, who is the patsy. You know what is it, a patsy? Well, a patsy is the guy who uh, fills out the coupon and gets shucked. The patsy is the guy who says, gee, that's a great idea. I'll try it first. Well, uh, I was the patsy. Flick was the skeptic. Flick was always about six months ahead of us, and Flick was always on top of everything. A skeptic. Well, one day, the wind is blowing out of the cold, frozen north, and we're struggling on our way to school. Me and Schwartz and Flick and Bruner wearing our sheepskin coats, wearing our helmets with the goggles. <laughs> the snow is up to our you-know-what, and we're struggling on our way towards the Warren G. Harding School when one of those perennial kid myths was brought up. Now, the idea of a believer and a non-believer almost always has to do with mythology. It doesn't do you any good to believe that today is not Tuesday when it's Wednesday. That is not mythology. You're just lousing up on the facts. That's all. A, a, a believer has to do with mythology. For example, there is one mythology that feels that man is basically a beautiful creature. Designed, built, and born in beauty. And it is only later on, society, that destroys him and makes him an evil, malevolent, murderous creature that ravens the world around him. Now, that's one belief. There is another belief that says that man is born a murderous, evil, ravening creature, and it is only society that keeps him in check. Now, which do you believe? Well, six of one, half a dozen of the other. 
There's evidence on both sides. And you will find people falling out in two groups. One believing one, one believing the other, and fist fighting their way one to the other throughout life, right? Well... We're struggling on our way towards the Warren G. Hart. Now, we had all kinds of myths, you know. One of the myths that we had in our little group was this. That inside every golf ball, there is a poisonous fluid. Have you ever heard that myth? And also, more than that, if this poisonous fluid, if you ever get inside of a golf ball, you know, you take the cover off a golf ball, and you throw a golf ball on a fire that this poisonous fluid is not only a fantastic acid that will destroy you instantly if you ever get any of it on you, but it also, if you throw it in a fire, will blow up and quite possibly completely destroy the entire neighborhood. Well, now, this was a very deeply held belief among kids, and, and uh, there were guys that believed it. There were other guys that, oh, come on, a golf ball, what are you talking about? Here, watch, watch, I'm going to throw one in the fire. Well, uh, I'll never forget the time that Jack Morton threw one on a fire and his entire house just disappeared in a puff of smoke. But, you know, people, we had that. Now, there was another one of these great kid myths that uh, that even to this day worries me a little bit. Uh, uh, every time I go to the bank and I see this clerk, there's this guy that I work with once in a while. I go in the bank, you know, and I try to cash my check with him. And it's a little argument we always have. And uh, I notice that he's always working with an indelible pencil. Well, now, that worries me, because there was a myth that went through the Warren G. Harding School like the bubonic plague, that if you ever get your tongue on the tip of an indelible pencil, you know, the kind that makes the purple stain, it is a deadly poison that will seep through the system, and you will probably get something very closely akin to leprosy, and will now just, you know, you're dead. That's it. Oh, it's true. It's true. What do you think? You notice you don't see any indelible pencils anymore? Hardly ever. That's right. It's true. Now, there was another... We had oh, uh, thousands of myths. One of the other myths was that if you ever went out at night and there were bats around, within five minutes, your entire hair is full of bats. And uh, <laughs> we, um, so every kid, you know, always wore a baseball cap when he was out at night because, you know, you never know. You don't want to come home with your head full of bats. And, uh, you know, a lot. Now, there were other myths. So one of the other myths, uh, which, uh, which was quite prevalent, and I, I, even this day, I suspect, and that is... If you ever swallow chewing gum, your stomach will stick together. And uh, you'll get all jammed up, and Babbo won't help you. x lax will not do the job. If you ever... I mean, it's, you know, it's just myth that if you ever swallow gum... Oh, I'll never forget the time. I, I, was, I was worried well past my 23rd year. Because at the age of 14, one day, sliding into second base... A guy put the tag on me. Farkas laid the tag right between the eyes. I came sliding in, and I had this double wad of double bubble gum. You know, the big double bubble gum, the kind of with the Mickey Mantle cards, but the pink kind. And that's considered to be the worst kind for sticking your stomach together, you know. I came sliding in the second. This guy laid the tag right between the eyes, and he hit me so hard. Boom, down goes the gum. I'm dead. I got up, and I'll tell you, until I was about 23, I was worried about it. Once in a while, I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning you know, with a pain in the gut, and I say, oh, it's going to get me yet. Well, now, one of the great myths that we had that came about, it came drifting out, and later it was, it was good to discover there was only a myth. It is not true. I found out later, scientifically, it is not true. One of the myths that we discovered that uh, was always uh, prevalent as a kid was the tongue myth. Have you hear about that? The tongue myth? And the tongue myth said that if the weather was cold enough and you're walking along and you decide to uh, mm, uh, taste the streetcar tracks, or let's say you decide to uh, lick the grease off, uh, off uh, a hubcap on the bottom of an Oldsmobile, your tongue would stick to this thing, and impossible. You could not get it off. And if you tried to get it off, it could pull your tongue right out. Either that or completely skin it, that you could not get your tongue off. Well, now, there were two schools of thought. There was uh, Bruner, who believed it so much that every time Bruner would walk past, we had these telephone poles that were made out of metal, you know, big steel telephone poles. Every time we walked past the telephone pole, when it was cold, Bruner would give it a six-foot berth. He would just walk in circles around everything like lampposts and that kind of stuff. 
Uh, Schwartz, he was playing it cool. Schwartz would never say much about it. Me, I was a believer. Uh, like all true patsies, I, I believe anything. You can, uh, friends, I'm, I'm serious. You could call me up tonight, believe me, and tell me that that uh, that the sky is purple and it's made out of old velvet and Peggy Fitzgerald is painting cats on it. I'd say, really? And you know what I would do? I'd go to the window to look. All my life it's been like that. I was taken. I'll never forget the time I was taken. I'm one of the, one of the worst embarrassing moments that I, I I can remember as a kid. I was sitting in Mr. Melton's geography class. Now I had Mr. Melton when I was in sixth grade. My homeroom teacher was Miss Robinette. Mr. Melton was this tall, distinguished-looking guy with a red neck who played the flute, and uh, he always played the flute at the PTA. And he was he looked a little bit like uh, a, a a taller and a skinnier Stan Laurel. Very worried teacher. And uh, one day, I'm sitting in there, and uh, Mr. Melton's up on the board drawing Peru. And uh, he's, you know, the principal exports of Bolivia, which uh, I became very much expert at. Tin. They export tin. Bolivia. I still remember that question. I can't answer your questions on anything else. I can't tell you. But tin, I know. They come Peru. And so, uh, Mr. Melton's up there drawing Peru. When all of a sudden, Helen Weathers, who's sitting ahead of me, big old fat Helen, she reaches over her shoulder and hands me a note, which had come back from the front of the room somewhere. And in the front of the room were these very special kids, you know, their names started with A and B and all that stuff. Uh, they're the smart kids, you know, they were all in the front. Way in the back with me and Schwartz and Zinsmeister and Helen Weathers. And, you know, the, oh, the, the losers, we're all sitting in the back there. And all of a sudden, I get a note. You know, I never got notes when I was a kid, especially from the front of the room. And I get this note, and it says, Dear Gene, who put the footprints on the ceiling? Signed, Patty Romaley. Well, now, I have to explain something to you. There, in every class, in every school, there is one girl that is the sex bomb of the entire school. Now, that doesn't mean she really is. That means every boy who has any kind of glandular structure at all falls into a shaking palsy when this girl is mentioned or she just walks by two blocks away. Your glasses cloud up, you know, that kind. Well, Patty Romelli was the ne plus ultra of all chicks. And she was in the other class. You know, like I was in the, you know, they had two classes like a 1A and 1B, uh, 6A and 6B. Well, I'm in 6B. She's in 6A. I have got a note from Patty Romaley. I mean, you know, this shows how what a gullible nut I am. You know, me getting a note from Patty Romaley. That's like me, you know, walking out of the studio and there's a note that says, uh, hey, man, let's make the scene. Sophia Lauren. Come on. You know, I put your friend crying out loud. But you know what I do? I'd say, yeah. And I'd run down to get my shoes shined. That's what I do. That's my trouble. And so I'd believe. See, so Patty Romani says, who put the footprints on the ceiling? I'm looking up there at the ceiling, see? I'm looking around. I don't see no footprints on the ceiling. I'm sitting there looking. I look in the back. And remember, this is Patty Romani said this, see? I look all around, looking around. Back, looking up at the top. And up in the front of the room, I hear blah, 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 Peru, blah, 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 Tin, blah, 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 Orinoco River, blah, 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 Tigris and Euphrates, blah, 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 Mountains, Andes, blah, 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 Meander Plain, blah, 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 Coastal Strip, blah, 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 blah. This is old Melton, you know, blabbing away. That's education, see. Blah, 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 blah. I'm looking for the footprints, Sam. I'm looking around for the footprints. All of a sudden... I look around to the back, and I look off to the left. I notice how kids say, I'm looking up to the ceiling, when all of a sudden, clock! I get hit in the back of the head with a geography book. And I look up, and it's Mr. Melton. He says, will you sit still? And he turns and walks up to the front of the class. He just banged me on the back of the head with a geography book. They would not get away with it these days, friends. I understand that. But let me tell you this, it did me some good. I'm, <laughs> you know, my head, I shake. You know, the, we had these big seven-pound geography books, you know, with the red, white, and blue maps inside that showed the trade winds and all that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah, I'm very intelligent about the trade winds. I could tell you about the doldrums, too. I was fascinated. One, one place that always fascinated me was the horse latitudes. I always wanted to visit the horse latitudes, and uh, little did I realize at the time that I was going to spend my life in the doldrums. So uh, I'm reading about this stuff, and I look up, and I'm still trying to find out 
who the heck put the footprints on the ceiling? When all of a sudden I am aware that about 65 kids in the class are snickering, snively, kind of, hee hee, oh, what a slob, look at that bum, yeah, what a clutch he fell for, it's not. I look around and my face, I could feel my face. Have you ever blushed so much that you could feel steam coming out of your socks? I could feel this red going right down my face. I've been taken. Not only was I taken on the scene with the footprints, but I was taken, obviously, on the thing that Patty Ramele would deign to write me a note. Me. I look around, they're all... <laughs> Alex Joshua's going... <laughs> all right, that's the kind of pantsy I was. And so the rumor had come down from high, from among, you know, the, the upper hierarchy of kiddom, that if you ever get your tongue on the telegraph pole, forget it, no tongue. You'll probably never talk again. And so we're walking along to school, and the wind is howling, and it's coming down from the steel mills, and we could see the Warren G. Harding School about two and a half blocks away, and that we're struggling our way through the snow drifts. When somebody brought it up, Schwartz, Bruner, one of the two, said to, hey, do you know that if you put your tongue on that on the tele, telephone pole over there, that it would stick? Do you know that your tongue sticks, huh? Is your tongue, I don't know what is it. You, you, it's so cold that your tongue sticks right to it, and they can't get it off. You, you just can't. they got to wait till summer. Well, you know, I said, yeah, really? I believe, yeah, wow, holy smokes, you mean your tongue sticks? And the Schwartz is playing it cool. He says, nothing. Bruner starts to cry. Walk along. What do you think Flick says? Flick says, ah, come on. God, uh, what are you talking about? Ah, no kid. You, you believe that stuff? I bet you guys believe that stuff about the golf balls. Oh, boy, wow. Hey, watch me now. Watch me. I'm going to eat. Uh, watch, watch this now. All right, you guys. Come on, now watch now. I'm going to eat an indelible pencil. Huh? The skeptics, see. Well, we go another 45 or 50 feet. We're arguing about whether or not your tongue sticks. And across the street, Esther Jane is struggling her way through the snow drifts. And, you know, we're all on our way to see Miss Shields, who's going to read Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy to us. It's going to be another big day at the Warren G. Harding School. Another great step forward in the cultural assimilation of America's youth. We're struggling through the snow. When Schwartz turns to Flick, I remember distinctly it was Schwartz who turned to Flick. And Schwartz says, yeah, well, I'll bet you're scared to put your tongue on it. Yeah. Yeah. This is the eternal walk down. Now, the walk down you find, friends, in practically every drama. You find the walk down, or what they call the confrontation of two forces, the resolution of the conflict. You find the walk down in Electra. You find it in Oedipus Rex. You find it in Hamlet. You find it in every great production. You find it in Bonanza, even. You even find it in I Love Lucy. You know, the last minute when she's hitting Desi on the head with the flying pan, he falls down to that. Well, this is the confrontation of great voices. With that, Schwartz turns to Fleck and says, Yeah, I'll bet you're scared to do it. Well, now, there was a code among kids. There was a code that once having been put on your metal, you could not chicken. And if you did chicken out, if you ever did chicken out, that you were dead. I mean, from that time on, it, was, it would hang over you. Especially if the, if the kid who was doing the challenging said one thing. I dare you. That is a magic kid phrase. Go on, I dare you. Go on, I double dare you. Well, what could Flick do? Like his lip curled. That kind of, the, you know, the, curl of the, the curled lip of the skeptic, the atheist in the middle of a Billy Graham meeting, you know, that curled lip, and Flick says, oh, come on. You don't believe that stuff. I dare you. Schwartz says, I double dare you. Go on, I double, double dare you. Go on. Ha-ha. <laughs> yeah, you see? You're not doing it, huh? Ha-ha. Uh, Flick is a coward. Da-da-da-da. Flick on a double, double dare you. Bye-bye-bye-bye. Friends, I have a feeling that the I dare you is not only limited to kids, I have a feeling that it even affects nations. Has it occurred to you that North Korea is saying, I dare you, ha, blah, 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 double dare you. And uh, you know, all the way up and down the line, 
Well, uh, you know, the, the nuttiness uh, that just doesn't stop. That, oh, that reminds me, speaking of nuttiness, friends, this is WOR <laughs> in Fun City. Yes, a radio free Broadway here. And uh, Schwartz has got Flick in a walk down. And Flick is a little bit bigger than the rest of his you know, sheepskin coat. He's got the he's got the, the the knife stuck down in his 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 high top shoes, and the knickers, his helmet. He always wore his helmet with a sort of a cocky angle, you know, with the with the flaps pulled up, snapped on the top, you know, like a real hot pilot type. And Schwartz is saying to him, "I double dare you! I double dare you! Put your tongue on that telephone pole right over there! I double dare you!" And the wind is blowing. <sighs> The temperature stands roughly three degrees. It is blowing down out of that great, that great flu of misery and cold Lake Michigan. It's coming down all the way from the Straits of Mackinac on a straight line from the Arctic Circle itself, carrying the breaths of wolves down that go howling past the great gaunt fingers of the open heart standing clear and bright against the leaden sky. How did you like that, huh? And two blocks away on the edge of the big swamp, standing brave against the howling wilderness, was the Warren G. Harding School. I'll never forget the Warren G. Harding School. We had this coat of arms, and it showed, it showed the Capitol Dome. And it said, in hoc agricola conch, in est spittle lauk. And uh, you could see money dribbling out of the bottom of the capital dome. And uh, translated from the Latin, that means uh, the teapot dome forever, or grab what you can. Which was the motto of the Warren G. Harding School. And the wind is howling through the wires, the high tension wires. All through my life as a kid, I can remember going to school under, under high tension wires. With those great big crossbars, with the wind going... <sighs> realistic, doesn't it? Well, it is realistic. Life is real, friends. Life is earnest. And that afternoon, under the gray, leaden, January skies, we learned the difference between myth, fiction, fact, rumor, countdowns, dares, and all the rest of it. Flick stands up tall and looks over at Schwartz and says, Oh, yeah? Who's afraid to put his tongue on the telegraph pole? And Schwartz goes, Yeah, 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 double, double, there, yeah, way, 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 double, double. You know that eternal kid chant? Are you aware, friends, that that chant, that particular tune, has been heard on this globe for over two and a half billion years? That it is believed that this was one of the first things that the first cave child did was to look at the other cave child that was born with him and go, yeah, 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 da 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 That chant, that same chant is heard in darkest Africa. It is heard in the igloos of the Eskimos. It is heard in Teaneck. It is heard in Hessville, Indiana. It is heard in Australia. And you know, adults never sing that tune. I've never heard say one of the salesmen say to me yeah 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 you're afraid they got a commercial yeah 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 never that is a kid thing well and it's a deadly kid thing it is every bit as deadly as the flute of the dyak it has hidden mystical meanings to every kid and every kid sitting out there listening to me right now knows exactly what I mean yeah, 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 da, da, yeah, 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 yeah. You can add all kinds of words like, uh, yeah, yeah, four eyes, four eyes, yeah, da, 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 yeah, what a four eyes, yeah, da, sissy, wah, 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 what a panty waist, wah, 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 Charlie, man, a Freddy, man, a man, a... You know, you can, you, you can just add lib. It's, it's like a kid calypso of hate. <laughs> it goes on and on with the sound of drums beating down on the soul. And Schwartz is laying it on flick. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Afraid to put your tongue on a telegraph pole. Yeah, yeah. Double, double, dare, yeah. Man, man, flick is a fink. Man, man. Well, the sound had echoed out across the street. Esther Jane Alberry heard it. And I, I can always remember that, that doughty figure, Flick, standing against that towering snowdrift and walking up, right up to this big iron, we had these gigantic, fat, they were about two feet across, these big iron telephone poles that were about 60 feet high and they had these big crossbars and they had all kinds of insulators all over them. I can remember Flick walking right up there. It was one of those great moments of heroism. You know, most of us hear about heroism. We read about heroism. We see it in the movies. But how many times have we ever witnessed to it actually in real life? You actually see a heroic act. Well, I can remember Schwartz yapping like some kind of insane hyena all around Flick's kneecaps. When Flick walked up, I will always remember Flick for this. He walked right up to that telephone pole. He stuck his tongue out. And he had a standard kid tongue, you know. He stuck his tongue out, and he looked around at Schwartz and says, All right, watch this. He stuck his tongue out again. He laid it on that. He says, that, that, they don't, that, That's all kid talk. I, your tongue don't stick. He stuck his tongue out and zap. Well, Schwartz backed away. Bruner is now down on his knees, whimpering. I am circling around because I am waiting to see which way the wind is going to blow. And Flick is standing right up next to the telephone pole with his tongue hanging out, and I would say a good foot and a half of it, laying right across that steel shaft, standing at three degrees above zero with the wind howling through the, through the insulated wires high overhead. All of a sudden, Flick's face whitens. He gets his white. And Schwartz says, okay, back up. Now get your tongue off, smart guy. Ah, da, da, da. And it dawned on all four of us that Flick's tongue ain't about to come off. That great big steel telephone call. Flick was bent over U-shaped, attached permanently to a telephone pole. What do we do now? We stood there for about two minutes. Schwartz looking at me, and I'm looking at Bruner. And and Schwartz says, "Hey, Flick. You know, you know. It's a funny thing about the guy that always pulls the dare. He's the first to get scared because he knows he he caused it. You know, he started it all." He said, "Hey, Flick. Flick. Can you get it off?" And Flick goes, <laughs> "You know, it's not easy to talk clear when your tongue is frozen to a telegraph pole." And Flick goes, and his nose is running. I mean, you know how kids' nose runs in the wintertime? Well, Flick's nose is running, and it's now beginning to form puddles around his kneecaps in the snow, you know. <laughs> and the wind is hollow. Oh, boy, it was, it was colder than that. Oh, it's running right the my tongue, which is, uh, I can't remember. Doc, come on. Uh, there's another expression, uh, something about... Brass monkeys? Oh, well, what the heck. Anyway, it was really cold. <laughs> this wind is howling. And all, all of us are standing there in our sheepskin coats, and we are scared. You know that terrible scared feeling of having actually caused something to come about, and now he's no going back. See? And, and uh, Schwartz goes over to Flick. He says, here, I'll blow on it. He's going, <laughs> Flick's tongue, I'll tell you, it was like ice cubes. Nothing. And his face is white, his eyeballs are rolling, and he is scared, and his nose is running. I'll tell you, it was very interesting to see an atheist get his comeuppance. Uh, you know, a, a skeptic is getting it. But not only was he getting that, we were getting it. And in the meantime, school is about two and a half minutes. You know, we're, uh, the bell is going to ring. we got to get there. It's late. And, and the wind is howling. And in those days, kids were very religious about getting to school on time. Because so was Miss Norton. Who was the principal? It's she. She had. A, she was a nut on this getting to school on time, you know. And so, so we're scared. And, and is, he's crying. Well, all three of us took off, which unfortunately is 
the most human of all reactions. You take off and pretend if you run away from it, it's not happening. And the three of us take off, you know, bah, down to school. We go running like mad. And off in the distance behind us, a tiny, solitary, U-shaped ex-skeptic is forever attached to a gigantic steel, that stainless steel spun kind, a stainless steel telephone pole. Well, we ran like we're out of our bird down to school. The wind is howling and the, the snow is up. The, we're up the steps. We're going in. And now we're sitting in class. And I remember Miss Shields calling roll. And she calls me. She calls everybody. And she says, let's see. Who's absent? Let's see. Uh, uh-huh. I mean, Akers is absent. Uh, do any of you know what's the matter with Flick? Does he have the flu? The flu is going around, as it always was going around. Is that the flu? Mm-hmm. With that, Schwartz says, Miss Shields. Miss Shields. And he's got his hand up. Oh, he's going to chicken out. He's going to do Miss Shields. And Miss Shields, yes. Schwartz, yes. Miss Shields. Flick. Yes. Flick. Yes. What is it? Flick. Flick's tongue is stuck to a telephone pole down by down by Martin's house. What was that? Flick's tongue is stuck to a telephone pole down by Martin's house. Flick's tongue is stuck to a telegraph pole in front of Martin's house? When? Mm. No. He's out there now. She's out there now? And I saw her face get purple. And then it got white. Then it got red. And she had this hair. See, her hair looked like a Brillo pad on the top of her head. You know, that kind of lady. And you could see her glasses cloud up. She says, Flick is stuck to a telegraph pole? And she turned and pow, out of the door she goes. Boom! By now, me and Schwartz and Bruner were com- totally and completely convinced. I mean, you know, the, the human soul, on the one hand, is very optimistic. On the other hand, it is totally pessimistic. And it will range like a pendulum between those two poles. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Either you think it's going to be a great day, or you think the bottoms fell out of your knickers, you know, forget it. Well, we were completely convinced... In fact, I can remember Bruner whimpering. summer. Flick's going to be here till summer. We had this rumor already started among the three of us that Flick was going to be there till summer, till baseball season. You know, and every day we'd have to go past him on the way to school. And they're going to have to come and give him, you know, castoria and stuff to feed him. <laughs> or pablum or something. Well, he's hooked at his pole. Well, Mrs. Miss Shields took off. And you could hear a lot of activity going, running around in the school. You could hear doors slamming and telephones ringing and all kinds of stuff. And out the school goes the school nurse. We could see him going out to school. Oh, we have, you know, school nurse. You could see cars leaving the whole bit. And then off in the distance, you have never, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't know of, of the more scary experience. How many times, friends, are you lying in your sack at night? Or you're walking along the street, and you hear off in the distance, you hear, the sound of a distant, approaching, and receding siren. Squad car, the police, the fire department, who knows what, an ambulance. But it's always whistling for someone else. It's always screaming in somebody else's world. You notice that? And you're always a kind of spectator on it. And in, most of the times you don't even notice it. You just hear it. Woo! Well, let me tell you, friends. Every time you hear one of those things whistle, there is somebody else at the other end of it. Somebody else. And we could hear in the distance. Woo! the sound of fire engines 
And somehow, we knew that it was connected with Flick. We knew that it was connected with the whole scene that me and Schwartz and Bruner and Flick had started about ten minutes before school, low this early morning, when we had all taken out to go to school after an innocent breakfast of Ralston and cream of wheat. And we had put on our high-top shoes and our socks in such complete innocence, not knowing that today was going to be a day of total disaster. We could hear... And they stopped about a block and a half away and out over across the gray horizon. All the kids are looking out of the window. You could see the lights, all the red flashing lights. <laughs> you know? And you see all these firemen jump off and you know they got axes and they, they're, they're going to chop them off. They got axes and they got all kinds of stuff. You know, they know what they're going through. They got axes and ladders and they're running. And there's long silence. And we're watching. I can remember Joshua Schwartz and all of us looking out. Helen Weathers, the whole crowd, peering out. Flick is out there in the darkness. One of us. You know, Flick the skeptic. You could see people out there. <laughs> you know, dozens of them. Well, the bell rang. You know, they had these automatic bells. The bell rang. And all of us went out to recess or someplace else. And we were gone. I remember it was about a 15-minute hiatus. And there's rumors all over. You know what they had to do? Did you hear what they did? They cut his tongue out. He'll never be able to talk. No. Oh, no, no, no. No, did you hear? Another kid come up. Hey, you know what happened? They came over there and they discovered they couldn't remove him. And now he's going to have to be there till summer. You got to put the fence around him. Yeah, Flick is, is... Yeah, you know what happens. You put your tongue on the on one of them poles and they get, it gets glued to it. It's uh, I don't know. It sticks to it. And never come off. And there were rumors all over in the school. Holy smokes. And the bell rings. We all go back in. It's after recess now. And now I go back into Miss Shields' class. And who is back? Miss Shields. And she is looking grave. And she's got that look. And you know, all kids can tell when grown-ups are really serious. You know, you can play around. You know when they're mad. You know when they're bugged. You know when they're irritated. But then there's a point when they're really serious. And you don't play around. You don't. We're all sitting there. You know, this is usually the time immediately following, immediately following the recess when we got Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy. And Miss Shields is standing up next to her desk. She had this great desk, and there were all kinds of rumors about what she had in her desk all the time. And you'd see these drawers you always want to get. And as a matter of fact, the lower left-hand drawer was filled with thousands of pieces of kid effluvia that Miss Shields had confiscated over the ages. She had over 242 cents of wax teeth that she had taken from the kids. As a matter of fact, she had four sets of mine. I've often, you know, felt like going back and getting them, but uh, never, I'll never forget the time that all the boys in class, en masse, one day, appeared in class wearing wax teeth. And all she did was walk up and down the aisle saying, all right, put them in my hand. Come on, spit them out. Come on, spit them out. <laughs> so she had a set of 23, you know, 23 sets of wax teeth. She had, oh, I'd say probably... Maybe seven or eight dozen rubber daggers. She must have had about 522 of these little things that you throw your voice with, that you buy for 10 cents, you stick it under your tongue, you're supposed to holler, help, help, coming out of trunks. She had all that kind of stuff, dirty books, she had it all, you know. And so she is standing up next to that desk, and she is not kidding around. She is wearing her purple dress that she always wore. That was her winter dress. She had this light green dress that was her summer dress. And so she had a purple dress. She's standing up in front of us. And she waits. And now the crowd is silent. And she said, I suppose all of you know what happened to one of our classmates this morning. She looked around, you know, that significant look like, you know. I suppose all of you know, and for those of you who did not hear about it, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. I want this to be a lesson to all of you. And furthermore, those of you who were involved in it are going to hear more about it afterwards. I might as well warn you of that now. Oh, no. <laughs> and I could hear Schwartz. He's back there with me with the SSC. I heard Schwartz. <laughs> you know, this is... He's the guy that did all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is obviously... 
You, he could be nothing less than an accomplice. I mean, you know, an instigator. He's a decoit. I mean, you know, this guy's an assassin now. <laughs> and Bruner is weeping. And she said, One of our classmates, Flick, has been taken home by the fire department. His tongue was frozen to a metal lamppost. Did you hear what I said? His poor little tongue was frozen to a metal lamppost. Poor little Flick. His tongue frozen to a metal lamppost. Now I have something to say about that. I know that some of you in this room were involved in what happened to poor little Flick this morning. Now you hear me? I know that some of you were involved. In fact, a lady who lived right near where it happened said that she saw some boys with poor little Flick this morning, and she said that she saw them push poor little Flick onto that telegraph pole, right onto the pole. Now, I want to know who did that. Who was responsible for this? Now, put up your hands. All right. I'll give you five minutes. I want to know in just five minutes who did this to poor little Flick. We sat there oh, five minutes. Oh, you know, you know, we've been... It's like we're kids, see? And, you know, like all kids, for years we've been working on the innocent look as an art form. We're sitting there, we're looking so innocent. Oh, I could just feel innocence pouring out of me. I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> and I look over and I could see, I could see Schwartz. Schwartz is sitting there. Do you remember these little cards they gave you at the Sunday school? These cards that would show these little fat babies, these little angels flying around blowing bugles with the little things around the head and all that little curls. Schwartz is looking like one of those little fat angels, blowing bugles. He's sitting there looking so innocent. And Bruner, I can't tell. Bruner looked like the driven snow. And the three of us are sitting there. And Miss Shields are just watching, looking. You know, we never often saw Miss Shields angry. Miss Shields was one of these teachers, you know, the kind of nice old maid type teacher who wept a lot and who would bring cookies once in a while for us and make us bob for apples and that kind of stuff. Oh, was she mad. You could just see it coming out of her. And she sat at her desk. And for five minutes, we played with maps of Peru and looked innocent. And then suddenly she stood up again. All right. All right, class. The five minutes are up. Now, one of you, if not more, in this room, know that you are guilty that you were responsible for what happened this morning to one of our little classmates poor little flick and you have not had the courage to step forward and to tell that you were involved but this morning when they took poor little flick home he would not say who was with him well I want to say this, that whoever you are, you will always remember what you did today. It will always be on your consciences. You could have frozen poor little Flick's tongue to that lamppost forever. And then where would he be? And what would you get out of it? <laughs> Well, I don't want to punish the rest of the class for what you did, whoever you might be. And you'll have to live with yourself. Remember that. You probably don't understand that now. But someday you will. I don't want to punish the rest of the class. So I'm going to read as we always do at this time of day. Rackety Ann and Rackety Andy. Now, you remember yesterday, class, when we left Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy, they were going with the camel 
with the wrinkled knees, and they were going after the balloon fairies. Now I read from chapter 3. And he said to Raggedy Ann, Raggedy Ann, let's climb upon the back of the camel with the wrinkled knees and go out after the balloon fairies. Well, Schwartz and Flick, somewhere off in the distance, and Bruner and myself, huddled under the howling cosmos of guilt. That day, Raggedy Ann, Raggedy Andy, and the camel with the wrinkled knees turned to ashes in our mouths. And that night, I went into the kitchen. Hurried home from school, scared. I got into the kitchen. My mother turned up from the sink as soon as I got in and said, Did you hear what happened to poor little Flick today? I said, No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> His tongue got stuck on a lamppost. I said, No. She said, Yes. And that teaches you a lesson. Now, that teaches you a lesson. I don't ever want to hear you putting your tongue on lampposts in cold weather. I said, yeah, right.